welcome to the Western and Central Melbourne Integrated Cancer Services Annual Forum for 2024. I'm Dish Hayrath, Clinical Director of WICMIX. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we meet virtually today. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. As we know, the mission of WICMIX is to improve patient experiences and outcomes by connecting cancer care and driving best practice. In doing so, WICMIX enables partner health services to continually improve the cancer care we provide to our diversity-rich communities across not just the Western and Central Melbourne region, but from across the state. Victoria is one of the most culturally and linguistically diverse states in Australia, and that is particularly true of the Western and Central Melbourne region, which is a highly diverse, multi-ethnic and multilingual community. Importantly, 25% of Victoria's population resides in this region. There is a growing body of evidence which suggests that people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds experience an inequitable care across the cancer care continuum. Cultural beliefs, difficulties navigating the health system, communication barriers and limited access to services and resources are significant factors contributing to the poor outcomes often faced by culturally and linguistically diverse people affected by cancer. Recently, WICMIC set out to assess the demographic characteristics cancer prevalence and burden among called populations at WICMIX Health Services, explore their needs and challenges and identify gaps and barriers in health service provision. Today's broadcast, Beyond the Barriers, Cancer Care Across WICMIX, will explore cultural and linguistic diversity through patient stories, expert insights and data. It will underscore the imperative for improving outcomes and experiences of people affected by cancer. I hope you find today's broadcast insightful and compelling in our continued shared pursuit of equity in cancer care and outcomes for all people affected by cancer. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Dr. Beverly Woon. I'm a consultant radiologist and I work uh, at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre as well as St. Vincent's Breast Screen. I think the biggest challenge for us as healthcare providers as a whole is inertia. Our healthcare systems are not created to be equity focused and it's not purpose built for health equity. And so we are now faced with the challenge of writing that in. And it can seem like a lot and it seems huge. And when we talk to people about it, for good reasons, people say it goes beyond what we can provide as healthcare services. And to some extent, that is true. Also, on top of that, there is the conversation about the lack of data, lack of agreement for definitions and research, which is also true. And coupled amongst, amongst all of that are the ongoing political challenges that we have in the everyday that further create inequity that seems to be a moving target. My name's Vijaya Joshi. I'm the Director of Strategic Programs at the VCCC Alliance. The VCCC Alliance is an alliance of 10 health services and medical research institutes that work together to try and address some of the most intractable and wicked problems around cancer treatment and care. My particular role oversees some areas that I'm very passionate about and they are health equity, consumer engagement, research and data, noting that those four areas are all very strongly interlinked as well. I think we're very lucky in Australia and in Victoria, we really are. We have um, pretty good health outcomes and we have pretty good access. I think there's a huge unevenness in our access and our experience. It's language, uh, racism and assumptions about disease uh, and care. 
I think seeing called communities as a homogenous group is also highly problematic. It's a very heterogeneous group in terms of age, um, in terms of all sorts of experiences. So, you know, even the acronym culturally and linguistically diverse is a bit of a misnomer, really. What are they diverse from? I mean, they really are this community is the community. They are the patient in front of you. Meu nome é Juliana. Eu sou uh, do Rio de Janeiro, no Brasil. Um, hoje eu tenho 36 anos. Às vezes eu esqueço quantos anos eu tenho. Mas é, eu estou aqui porque eu vim visitar minha irmã e acabei ficando no, no país. Então, para desenvolver minha carreira e para estudar. Uh, mas isso tudo começou depois de um diagnóstico de câncer que eu tive uh, aos 27 anos e muitas coisas mudaram. Uh, eu fiz grande parte do meu tratamento lá, mas quando eu mudei para a Austrália eu continuo uh, com acompanhamento uh, e hormonioterapia e vivo o des os desafios de ser um imigrante uh, e fazendo um tratamento oncológico. Mas fui muito bem recebida pela Austrália e sou muito feliz de estar morando aqui. Nowadays, uh, I am in remission. What is good? And I think the other thing is around racism, which I know can be quite controversial. We we have we're very lucky to have a universal health system. Everyone can walk through the door of a hospital. Technically, they have the ability to do that, and. Technically, the clinician that they see will treat them the same as everyone else. There is racism in our health industry. It is not necessarily always malicious, but it is there. You know, I have been present when an MDM has taken place and a clinician has felt comfortable giving information um, and a history of a Vietnamese patient in a Vietnamese accent, although he himself was not of a Vietnamese background at all. If we want to change the landscape, we have to address the realities, which sometimes there's racism inbuilt. We know that racism can be quite, um, it can be overt, but it can also be very quiet. And treatment and, um, treatment and care is built on relationships, and relationships are based on how you understand someone, how you connect with someone. And if you have a block around that connection, whether you're a patient or a treating clinician, then that automatically sets up a barrier that can sometimes be impenetrable and can affect the treatment and care that is provided. My name is Tudhir Sakhuja. My name is Hyderabad. My name is Tudhir Sakhuja. I was born in Hyderabad. It is uh, the city of Char Minar, of four minarets. It is in the southern part of India. But uh, at the age of 17, I had to move out because of my, the nature of my work. I worked in different parts, different regions of India, each with its different culture, different language, and different customs. The point that I'm trying to make over here is that India or the Indian culture is not monolithic or homogeneous as it may be understood by some. As for languages, there are 22 uh, languages recognized as official languages in the Indian constitution, not to speak of other 122 languages and thousands of other smaller languages or dialects. Uh, while Hindi is uh, understood by a majority of the population, and yet there is a considerable number of people in India to whom Hindi is more of a foreign language. Therefore, Hindi may represent broadly the Indian language, yet is not entirely so. I lost my first wife to cancer, multiple myeloma, about 20 years ago. Though at a late stage in my life, as I seemed to find a life partner, a good life partner, in my wife Shobha, who has been living in Melbourne for the last 40 years, 
we got married in 2016. I've had three primary cancers, all different, not connected to each other, being primary cancers. So that way I've got a hat trick of experience of cancers. My initial feeling differed every time I was diagnosed for a new primary cancer. My first cancer was a oral cancer, cancer of the tongue. On the initial diagnosis, I was not surprised since I held myself responsible for it. Not surprised as I had been a smoker for many years. So, if I was angry, I was not angry with God, I was angry with myself. Obviously, there is no feeling of why me. There is no feeling of denial too. But two years later, when I had the second cancer, again a primary one, of the lung, I felt sad. I felt sad because it was then that I was just coming out of my first cancer. I viewed this cancer as divine injustice to me. But then the doctors explained to me that instead of the cancer, oral cancer having traveled elsewhere, it's better to have a separate cancer which is not connected with the first one. So I took solace from that and my thoughts were when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Now coming on to third cancer, again a primary cancer. Uh, it was detected uh, incidentally during the scan for the lung cancer. All along those two years before it was treated, it was termed as suspicious until it was confirmed to be malignant about two years later. So, uh, it was in the early first stage as compared to stage three of the first and second cancers. Therefore, the sense of relief. My thoughts then were, I come out of bigger problems twice. This is a child's play. My name's Linda. I'm uh, from an Italian background. I speak Italian on holidays. I'm a secondary school teacher and I've been part of the Peter Mac uh, Consumer Register projects. I did one last year with Catherine Devereaux on end of life, the end of life resource that was produced. My mother had ovarian cancer and has since passed away. My sister had breast cancer and has passed away. My father was diagnosed with bladder cancer and is a fit and healthy 83 year old. They were part of the post-war immigration from Southern uh, Europe. So they came out, mum came out in 1951 and dad came out in 1960 for opportunities and to escape post-war Europe. They really? met in Carlton at the St George's dances like everybody did. She was chaperoned by her two brothers and a friend. <laughs> oh God, yeah, you'd go anywhere by yourself. He met mum there and yeah, that was it. They actually became very, very good at it and everyone used to watch them dancing because they were so expressive. They actually they were really, really good. Me, my best friend, my sister, um, we went to the doctor and he said, like, y you have cancer, uh, you have a breast cancer. And like in one sentence, you need to go through chemo, like radiation, surgery, uh, uh, mastectomy and I said okay let's let's do this I remember like was a f was Friday uh, and I found my oncologist that I am so grateful uh, about his life and uh, we scheduled uh, to next Monday the appointment and like everything started I don't know I like something inside me was like broken but at the same time, like, let's do this shit, you know, like, like, let's go, let's do this. Can I say shit? You sure yeah. can. Okay. <laughs> yeah.
Uh, one of the biggest challenges, like it was uh, understand everything together, because it's like uh, it's not like just a diagnosis. Like it's a lot of things. First of all, like uh, cancer is surround like for a lot of stigma. When you like principally in my culture, when you listen like cancer, like it's like and I think like even me that uh, had the knowledge, like I thought for the first time in my whole life uh, that I could die. Something that I try to talk a lot because people sometimes don't mention, like the physical modifications, like all the things that I passed through, like but mastectomy was like the, like the point. After the surgery, I remember uh, as like today, uh, I was in front of the mirror and I saw like one breast and without uh, the other breast. And I thought like, like, who am I? It's not only the breast, a lot of changes, but I think this is very important and I, I try to manage this until today, <laughs> like doing therapy and like uh, trying to love myself the way I am now. This is a thing that normally when I talk with other patients, like they have these issues, but no one talk about this. Also about sexual life, about fertility. My sister was first. She was diagnosed about 10 years ago and that was quite shocking. Like, what do you mean you're 43 and you've got breast cancer? Like, oh God, what is that gonna do? You know, so that was probably the worst diagnosis. I come from a family of real pragmatist, stoic kind of people. So it was like, okay, what's the plan? Right, this is what it is. It'll be what it is. What do we need to know? What do we need to do? So she was very practical about it all, even down to, you know, deciding how and when she would have her treatment and then deciding to stop because she didn't like it anymore. Uh, and then planning her funeral, which is part of the um, other project that I did with Catherine. You know, she like set everything up beautifully and, you know, bury me in the ugly pink dress, you'll find it, don't worry, it's in the cupboard, you know, this sort of thing. Picked all the music, all that sort of stuff. Dad was just worried because he didn't have his wife or his eldest daughter. So he was quite stressed about it until it was, you know, declared that he was actually quite safe from this. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult because you need almost a gatekeeper of the information, like stop calling them, call me and I'll tell you and you can feed that information back out again. Um, otherwise you could end up, you know, with visitor after visitor after visitor and phone call after phone call and you don't actually do any rest or <laughs> any recuperation. So that, that, that can be, you know, quite usual. I was the gatekeeper for my sister in the end. Um, it's a burden but someone has to do that um, for the benefit of the patient so uh, yeah, it's burdensome but I wouldn't call it a problem and you know, it's quite you feel rather important being the gatekeeper of the information. It's my name is Monita Masiti Murter or Monita Mashiti Murter. Um, you can call me Monita. <laughs> I'm the cultural inclusion lead at St. Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne. Um, and my preferred pronouns are she and her. Now, part of my role as cultural inclusion lead at the health service is I provide as much support as I can to extend culturally responsive care to our staff. So that might include training, um, uh, particular projects, uh, research, uh, publications, anything that will make life a um, little bit better on the receiving end of our culturally linguistically diverse patients. It happens in interaction and people sometimes think, oh, it's personalities or unconscious bias. They see someone walk in and they immediately assume they have to communicate or do it in a certain way. We're also assuming a certain culture of the healthcare professional. So, you know, at St. Vincent, 64% of our staff are born overseas or have a parent born overseas. That's a high level of cultural interaction with our patients, 40% of which who are born overseas. So, and they represent 188 different countries of birth. They request languages, you know, um, interpreter services, 88. Uh, languages that they request interpreter services for, and 31 faiths. So that diversity, um, culture and language will impact, not just from our patient perspective, from our healthcare perspective as well. I think the major one for us as radiologists, and I'm sure for many um, moments of clinical interactions, is when there is a language barrier. 
um, the data shows that um, when we use an, the interpreter, which are an amazing and incredibly skilled service, um, that those consultations take longer. Um, and the gain of understanding of where the patient is in their health literacy and their desires for their health outcomes can take even harder, not just because of time, because we're using a third person to translate, but also a difference in where you stand in terms of your beliefs in health. My name's Kerry Dunn. I, my pronouns are she, her. I work with the Royal Melbourne Hospital looking after language services and I also um, support spiritual and cultural diversity. I like to look at um, our service, language services and working with interpreters as an integral part of and I guess an extension of every clinical interaction. So when we're talking about communication, we're talking about creating an environment where people are able to make informed decisions and be able to communicate and be actively involved in their care. Usually when I deliver workshops, I put it down to, I try and flip it and I put it down to the what, how, who question. So you have to think yourself, um, when you're going into an, a, to have a discussion about your treatment um, with your local GP, um, you know, what would you like to hear uh, uh, in terms of like a story of truth or a story of hope? And that's culturally laden because a lot of our culturally linguistically diverse communities may prefer a story of hope rather than a story of truth. Um, so that disclosure element is really big. And then there are cultural questions like, um, you know, do you have a gender preference? Who looks after you? Um, any faith traditions or faith practices that will um, influence the care that you receive? Um, even intensity of treatment, whether you want it high or whether you want it, you know, or your health literacy is a, a, at a level where you think, oh, this is, this is the right fit. Um, but sometimes for cultural reasons, um, you know, family members may request high intensity um, because then they're at least trying. They're trying to get their um, loved one better. Um, even, and that brings me to the role of family. When you go in, you know, um, in terms of how do you see your role as a patient? Do you see your role as passive or active? So if you're an individualist, you're active. If you're from a collective, you tend to see it as a passive. So you leave the decision-making to your family. So in terms of that what, that, that always will take a, um, have a role in that interaction. And then it's about how would you like that discussion to happen, that communication style. That's, that's the big part number two. Um, and that looks at, at like, um, you know, do you prefer it to be indirect or direct, high context, low context? Um, so, you know, do you prefer the rip the band-aid approach in that whole treatment discussion? Or do you need that building of trust and relationship and talking about everything else and then getting into the real difficult discussion? Because you need to trust the person who's delivering the news to you. Um, and if that's a priority to you from your cultural perspective, well, that will make or break whether you will decide to go ahead that day. Who will be in that discussion with you? So some people, if they're very, you know, uh, particularly health professionals will say, I can manage it on my own and maybe with a friend. Um, and individualist cultures will look at that as well as saying, you know, just myself or a family member or a friend. But a number of culturally linguistically diverse communities will say, well, actually maybe talk to my family first and then talk to me. Um, it's about getting the right story to the right person in the right way. You know, at the interpreter level, we've talked about that a lot, when they're at the clinician, interpreter, patient level. Um, and to really recognise that family structures in that interpreter level are also really important to understand, but not necessarily to put that unnecessary burden of language interpretation on a family member. For people who aren't able to communicate in English or require the services of an interpreter, that's just something that goes along with the territory. So it's not a nice to have, it's a need to have. When we miss the opportunity to provide an interpreter, there can have there can be implications in terms of the unexpected readmission rates if anyone is an impatient. Um, it, it can also have a, an impact on a patient's length of stay um, as well. When we work with interpreters, it's not purely for the benefit of a consumer, it's for everybody's benefit.
to make sure that we're providing safe care. There's a lot of opportunity there to inform people about their rights, to access and to be able to ask for the services. That's basically a, a right. Dad had communication problems in the sense that his accent is so heavy that it was easy to assume that he didn't understand what he was being told. His knowledge of his own health is actually really very good and he's, he's able to express himself in English really well, like sophistication of his ideas. He's all there, um, so to be spoken to in a condescending way, um, maybe a little bit patronising, uh, was frustrating for him. The assumption that he doesn't know what you're talking about uh, because his accent is really heavy. An increased need to come along to appointments with him, to drop him off to appointments, to make sure that uh, you know, one of us was in the room to ask the questions and get the information. I mean, I don't think anybody meant to, it wasn't deliberate, it's just a bias and it, it happens. You, you go in thinking that what you're being told is everything, that you don't know that there's more that you could ask. And you end up being so overwhelmed that, you know, when the question comes, you know, oh, do you have any questions? It's like, oh, God, I don't know, do I? Um, and then you think of a thousand things on the way home. In both cultures, I think uh, we look uh, more, we look uh, more for the treatment for cancer and not for the patient. Like the implications we have in, in the, the, the patient's life. And also things that I, uh, normally talk about body image, sexual life, financial concerns, like you go to the doctor and they don't know like if you have conditions to do the treatment or not, uh, professional life, fertility. I think this is like both cultures need to look more uh, the, the human, not the cancer. We do know that um, some people might find the word cancer quite triggering or uh, it might be a taboo subject that people might try and avoid or people might like to um, swap out different words and perhaps use tumour or um, something similar um, in replace of that. Let's start with the word cancer. So I think across a number of languages, um, interpreters might interpret it as tumor. Um, and so, and historically, um, I put it down as, um, if you call it a tumor, you can maybe still treat it. It might still be, there's still that hope piece. So you can just imagine if you're on the receiving end of that type of explanation, um, and you think as a health professional, you did everything right through the interpreter, then, um, you really need to know how your service was communicated and how the treatment and illness was communicated to make sure um, that the patient is not left with particular questions and impressions of, of the treatment that they're receiving. In Brazil, we have like a, this uh, cancer as a stigma. As you heard this word, uh, the word as synonym of death. And a, lot of, uh, a lot of things, things are changing. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, I use it to be a volunteer in an institute in Brazil that we try to, to change this uh, and uh, have uh, uh, important information about cancer and uh, show, look, like I had cancer and I am here. In Indian culture, a serious disease like cancer is often, often kept under wraps. They don't speak about it. Some of this attitude comes from the shame uh, of having the disease because in Hinduism we believe that such a dreaded disease to come is because of our karma or the, deed, or the deeds that we do in this birth 
or even in our previous birth. I know across the precinct that there are quite a few faiths that do work across the precinct and that's their role. So they'll come for a few days here and there and they'll work across the precinct because of course the location is really key and that works really well for everybody there. So um, it can be any, any particular faith that people have requested. So um, our teams are great with um, those connections within community. Um, I know we've even um, worked with somebody who's, you know, flown into state to, to come and help out with a, with a person and, you know, with their, their kind of their last rights. And so, you know, it's about having those services and knowing what's available and recording a person's religion as well is really important because while that's not a mandatory question, um, we often find that that is skipped a lot of the time. I'm a Hindu by birth, but uh, not very ritualistic really. I would say that I'm more spiritual rather than religious. In any case, uh, Hinduism is a way of life rather than a religion. Let me explain this. Hinduism embraces many religious ideas. For this reason, it is sometimes referred to as a way of life or a family of religions, as opposed to, say, just a single organized religion. You know, you might commonly find a patient refusing treatment for religious reasons, and religious reasons could be because um, they believe in fatalism, um, and they may believe that, um, you know, no cancer treatment is necessary because it's already predetermined. And part of it is having a discussion there, really, about w what it involves. I always like to say to people um, to be curious in your interactions because we all have different ways, different um, understandings, different beliefs. Um, when we talk about health and illness and ways of being ill or sick and who we might talk to about um, our health and illness, um, medications that we might seek out. Um, so I think how we create that trust and, and ask those questions of, um, of people we're interacting with can, can help draw out the best way to provide that patient-centred care. My dad was going into his surgery and they were asking him what background he was. His accent's so strong that um, they were asking him where he was from and he told them he was Italian and, and he starts talking to them about opera. This is on the table. He's you know, sort of just outside. <laughs> He's about to be knocked out. Um, and they asked him if, you know, he asked them if they'd heard of opera. Opera is the best thing ever, blah, blah, blah. And you don't know Giuseppe Verdi and, you know, carrying on like he always does. And so they decided to put opera on, his favourite opera, La Traviata. Uh, so that's what he was listening to as he went under. So that was really sweet and I'm sure they turned it off the second he was out. Generally, if you ask somebody what is culture, the understanding of culture is very limited. Uh, culture actually includes the race, the gender, uh, the religion and ethnicity. Now, I feel there's a requirement of sensitizing, better sensitizing healthcare providers of these factors. In addition, there are issues of migration, the issues of uh, settlement, socioeconomic status, etc. Maybe a better understanding of these aspects is required. I never had problem to ask again, like uh, if I 
if I didn't understand the, the, do the, do the doctor, for example, and I like say, say again because they don't understand my accent and whatever. Uh, but I consider myself like uh, in a different position because I am in a different stage of my treatment. When people like just receive the diagnosis, it's very challenging. Uh, obviously, the barrier will will be like bigger comparing to mine. And uh, what I would say, like uh, people will ha struggling like uh, navigate in healthcare system because I never uh, was asked if I need some help. And I know people, a lot of people need more help than me with this. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Many resources are already available online. Uh, for example, uh, how to speak to clients who have low English proficiency. Or for that matter, uh, the teach back technique. The teach back technique, I'll give you a small example. If a doctor asks me or tells me, this is the way you got to take this medicine. He should not ask me just that, have you understood? And I say yes or no. But a better way could be to ask me to repeat the uh, method in which the medicine has got to be taken. There are lots of, I guess, resources um, for communication that are around and, and there are also a lot of um, apps that have been professionally translated and I stress the word professionally translated here. Um, so things like Cold Assist, um, which has been developed in conjunction with the CSIRO and Western Health. Let's take the example of Peter Mac. I think it's quite adequate because a telephone interpreting service is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this only when the on-site interpreters are not available. Uh, this is not just for the patients, but also for the clinician. There is a place for digital technological support um, for the moments in between when an interpreter is not required. And so to that effect, St. Vincent's Hospital Melbourne developed the Talk To Me app, which is um, not an app on the Apple Store, I should clarify. It is a website. Um, Talk To Me covers about 450 phrases um, of 24-7 care, nothing too clinical. It, the most clinical it gets will ask whether um, a patient is in pain and show me where the pain is on a scale of 1 to 10, but nothing where you would actually require an interpreter. It would be really good to come out of those appointments with a transcript of what's been spoken about. Medication names, medication doses, treatment plan, the whole bit, symptoms, what to expect next. In this day and age, with all sorts of AI available, it's hard to believe that someone with language barriers, even someone who's just completely overwhelmed, doesn't leave with a transcript of what we talked about. Oh my God, why don't we have this for the probably the most serious illness that anyone's going to have, where they're, all they're thinking about often is how they're going to die. <laughs> And so they're not listening to a lot of the information. And sometimes, you know, you go in as a support person and if you're not hearing what you're expecting to hear, you stop hearing. So to come out with the list, the plan, the transcript, the you're going to do this first, this is what you're going to experience, this is what you need to take. After that, if that doesn't work, we're going to be doing this, we're going to be doing that. It would be such a beneficial tool what advice would you give to other carers of cancer patients? Do what's instinctive, do what feels right, and ask as many questions as you can. Know that there's stuff out there, even though you haven't been officially told that there's anything out there, and do cool, fun stuff with your loved one. Life's too short, make it good. So in our work at the VCCC Alliance, we do support a lot of promising ideas, uh, in for clinicians and researchers and clinical researchers working with called communities. And I want to highlight here that a lot of this work is driven by very committed clinicians who see a problem, who 
see a cohort of patients that aren't receiving, who are missing out, and say, what can I do about that? And I think sometimes they do that without the authorising environment to do that and sometimes without value being placed on them taking that extra step. But I think it highlights the value of having a really diverse population in terms of who is providing the clinical care and who is um, undertaking that research and what they see is important in that research. I think that can also be enhanced through um, better representation across leadership in order to show that those concerns are being taken seriously and valued. So we've supported some really good work um, around looking at why people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities um, don't use symptoms and urgent review clinics and get the care that they need, for example, um, across Austin and Peter Mac particularly, but there is potential to scale that. And that work is now continuing in the next phase of our programming. That work was consumer-led and working with the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria to really try and identify what were the barriers, what was preventing people from accessing those sorts of clinics. Uh, we know that there's also work we're trying to get on the front foot. We are supporting work around the lung cancer screening program. So we've got researchers working with primary care physicians and with select uh, communities looking at how we can uh, proactively make sure that communities are referred into that lung cancer screening program that kicks off on the 1st of July 2025. What sort of resources and tools do they need? From a primary care physician point of view, what sort of things do they need to know about referring someone into that program who may have poor health literacy, who may not speak English, who may have had a negative experience with the health system? So those are some of the things. We've also supported a really great program which has had some traction at the national level on trying to identify why data in health services around culturally and linguistically diverse communities is so poor. And we've um, uh, supported a researcher uh, at the Austin Hospital to do this. Uh, she's been working with Nemex around this and has identified that there really is quite poor data quality, even when the fields are there, even when the values are there, even when the software supports it. Often it's an implementation problem. So here we've discovered that we've actually created the right policy environment, we've created the right technological environment to create that data capture. What's been missing is the implementation piece, the work with the ED clerks, with the ward clerks, with the outpatient staff to ask those questions in a sensitive way. And we can see that that has worked really well. What are the overarching policies we have in place? What record keeping systems do we have to make sure that we collect that right data of, you know, every person who's registered across every health service in Victoria? There's a mandatory question that is asked of what's your preferred language and do you require an interpreter? So having that information accurately recorded for every person um, and therefore then we know that as that person progresses through their journey um, with it, any particular healthcare service that that information is there and we're able to actually then provide an interpreter in the right language um, in the right way if we've you know accurately recorded that information and so I guess that's one level and making sure that then we can you know have that service that's linked there and then it's about making sure that we provide that service that goes along with that appointment at every point that's required to. So, and that's about training as well, um, I think, um, and making sure that people are aware of um, how to access or work with an interpreter because it's different at every um, at every hospital, um, depending on where you are. If you're, you know, in a in a city or you're out rurally somewhere. Some people may be reticent to answer that question and I think that needs to be done asking sensitive questions around cultural origin, around religion, around language because for a lot of people that information has been used against them in the past 
And it's not enough just to say this is for your benefit. You actually have to demonstrate why it's for their benefit. So one is Engage Pacifica. Um, and the founder for that is Anastasia Gray Barbero, and she's a mover and shaker. She's not medical, from my understanding, but she has created in the north um, a community, grassroots based um, community that looks at Pacific Island cultures and those who belong or tap into that. They provide a lot of health literacy um, that is culturally and language appropriate. Dr. Linny Fong, who is the founder of the Waterwell Project. Um, and she saw the need for giving health literacy information and tools um, at, at a cultural and linguistically appropriate level for the community. And so her, um, commu her uh, charity organisation actually provides that service at the community level for asylum seekers, migrants and refugee populations. We have this government-based health provision. And so that has to reflect the needs of its society. Um, it has to pivot so that we do value where we all individually come from to some extent um, and really embrace that. It's been a long time um, coming. Trying to, to make changes when the data is poor rather than just accepting that poor data. That's the first area. The second area is leadership. We really need more diversity in leadership for two reasons. It's important for younger clinicians and researchers to see that there is that career path, but it's also important for those people in those positions to be able to create the authorising environment for this sort of research to occur. We have an inequity here, what are we going to do about it? And I think more diversity at the leadership level will make sure that that happens. Culturally and linguistically diverse groups are groups, they're incredibly uh, different and diverse within that group. Um, there is huge heterogeneity and I think and one OCP under the banner of called would be too reductive down to some basic elements around what constitutes difference, be it language, be it cultural background, be it religion. I think we need a health equity lens across all aspects of our optimal care pathways um, and um, how we deliver an outcome, say, you know, from diagnosis to operation in X amount of time, that should be, that, that's standard. That, that's how we should be affording care to all peoples. Um, I think instead of an optimal care pathway specific to a cold group, we need to ask, well, within this optimal care pathway, how do we ensure we meet those needs? So if we just take a, a bit of a step back and, and rather than looking at each individual group that may be experiencing inequity and trying to create a bespoke solution from them, if we actually look at what are the drivers of those inequities, we'll find that there's a lot of commonality. Racism affects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It also affects a lot of overseas born people. The drivers of that racism are very, very different. I understand that, but perhaps the solutions could be similar. And that's the solution that needs to be embedded into the system, which will enable multiple populations to benefit. And I don't mean to suggest through all of this that people are willingly racist or willingly um, uncaring. I think our clinicians work incredibly hard. They are very time poor and they are doing the best they can. What they lack is the leadership and the support resources to help them to do a better job. Um, in terms of that sort of cultural safety and cultural, culturally relevant care aspect. If we're really talking about equity for called patients or equity full stop, time is the most valuable resource to give to break down those equity barriers to then form equality for all. And for us to be able to confidently do that at the policy level, we actually need to be able to wrap our arms around the fact that if you spend more time because the patient has all these complex measures, 
That's a great thing. In my book, which I wrote after my first cancer, it's called the uh, From the Horse's Mouth. It's on Amazon. On page four, I have dedicated this book to all the healthcare providers of Peter Mac and Royal Melbourne. That was a starting point, which I saw that how many people over here are working for us? It's not just the doctor and the nurses or the others we meet face to face. There's so many people, the researchers and people in different fields who make this great hospital Peter Mac. I'm not flattering Peter Mac, no. I really feel that health providers, they are doing a great job and I owe it not just to them, but to societies. Clinicians are caring and kind. They want to make that connection. Often they're not supported to make that connection in the best way possible or they don't know how to. And so, as you say, organisations like WICMIX or, uh, or any of the integrated cancer services or support organisations that can support clinicians with really clear, easy to access information that will help them is, is kind of the name of the game for me moving forward. I think in the, sh in the medium term, what I would really like to see is better data. At the moment, we have a hunch that they have poorer experiences. We have a hunch that they have poorer outcomes. I would really like to see some rigor and value placed on quality data around culturally and linguistically diverse people in screening programs, in treatment, in clinical trials, to actually find out what the true picture is. Because that is really going to help us address some of the issues of inequity. I think a lot of the data is dismissed because the data set's too small, so we don't have the power. But how can this be true when one in four people in Australia are born overseas? So there's an issue with the data, not, not the subset of the population. We need to value that data. You know, people are quite willing to walk past this sort of data inequity. We've had, a, we've had a years of agitation around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled health. And what that means, again, th that has led to the establishment of national and state-based peaked bodies, not to mention regionally based bodies to provide that kind of service. So the precedent exists for, I guess, the system to adjust. This is not necessarily a new thing. No. It's just about creating, having the right environment and having the right data and having the right agitators to do it. internationally we are the envy and so I, I am very proud to actually belong to such a service. It is a completely amazing privilege. But we can do better and we will do better. We need to start at the low-hanging fruit. Let's start with language. It's the pivotal, it is the core of a relationship with a health provider that we can communicate. Let's start there. Those diagnosed for cancer newly must take hope uh, from the fact that the treatment that they receive for cancer here in Australia is among the best, if not the best, in the entire world. The first one that comes to my mind is actually my sister. Yeah. So she um, was diagnosed with uh, triple negative breast cancer um, at the age of 38 um, and within 18 months um, passed away. So it was a really torrid and furious path for us all and us, of course especially for her. 
Um, and the reason that's most memorable um, and has the most profound impact is because up to that point for me as a clinician, I mean, I, I was clinical. I, I had obviously been a healthcare consumer, um, but this was a turning point for her and for me and for all of us who loved her. Um, and I think there is something to be said, and my hat's off to all cancer survivors and those who love them, um, to witness what cancer does um, from, you know, not just the physical, um, but that emotional, mental, and for some spiritual level. Um, it really, really cuts to the core. Uh, and when you lose someone young on top of that, um, the order of life seems to really turn upside down. And I think it's most memorable for me because the unusual or I guess a funny gift that comes from losing, losing someone you care about is that the empathy is then written into your everyday. Um, and that before, when I look back at time as a clinician, although a bit younger, before Anita got sick, I did try to operate empathetically, but it's another level when, you know, we have an, a lived experience as a carer. And I have all lots of points of privilege in my story. It's really sad for me to know that degree of grief that I experienced would be compounded by inequity. That's, um, will probably not leave me until we sort this stuff out. We need to look for the human and like, uh, know that we don't have only Australians. We have people with different necessities. Like, and also each one are unique. Be curious, ask the questions. People do want to help and, and help you understand why they're doing what they're doing. It's about getting the right story to the right person in the right way. You are important. You are unique. In uh, Royal Melbourne, I stayed for 17 days after my first surgery. I wrote down the name of each and every nurse who got me back to uh, health. And each and every nurse is mentioned by name in the last page of my book. Gratitude to them. Being able to provide that service for somebody makes you feel that you've achieved, um, made, a ch made a difference, I guess, for that particular person at that particular time. Think positive. It will all turn out to be positive. We all have to go one day. It does not matter, but how we go is essential. Go smiling rather than crying.